Hello and welcome back to World 360. How did a Chinese envoy in France create a major diplomatic mess? Why did Japan snub South Africa for the upcoming G7 summit in Hiroshima? And lastly, how has violence in Sudan affected its seven neighbours? We answer this and more in today's episode. So first up, China's top diplomat in France. Beijing's ambassador to Paris, Lu Shai, has a history of making controversial, provocative remarks. In the past, he said Taiwanese people had been brainwashed by ideas of independence and that they need to be re-educated. But Lu's latest stint has created a diplomatic mess that seems to contradict the stance of the Chinese government itself. Last Friday, in an interview with French broadcaster LCI, the Chinese ambassador questioned the sovereignty of the former Soviet countries. He said, the countries of the Soviet Union have no effective status in international law because there is no international agreement to recognize their status as sovereign countries. Now, this sparked outrage, especially among countries like Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Lu was later summoned by the French government and it was communicated that his remarks were considered unacceptable. Now, we're all familiar with China's wolf warrior diplomacy, an assertive style of diplomacy adopted by Chinese diplomats ever since Xi Jinping took over as president of China. But the Chinese government didn't seem to back Lu on his latest remarks. Instead, it appeared to go into overdrive to assure its European partners that this was not the stance of Beijing. In a press conference earlier this week, the Chinese Foreign Ministry clarified that China respects the status of the former Soviet republics as sovereign states after the Soviet Union's dissolution. The Chinese embassy in France also appeared to have taken down a transcript of Liu's interview on its website on Monday. The embassy also later notified that Liu's comments were not a statement of policy, but an expression of personal views. There could be some deeper implications of Liu's remarks. This controversy doesn't bode well for China's efforts to be seen as a peacemaker for Russia's war in Ukraine and its recent outreach to Europe. Meanwhile, the Latvian foreign minister has called for a complete retraction of Liu's statement. Perhaps the Chinese embassy in France's decision to take down the transcript of the interview was a sort of step in that direction. Now on to our second topic, the G7 summit, which South Africa won't be attending. In what appears to be a snub, Japan, which is set to host the G7 summit in Hiroshima next month, has invited the African Union, but not South Africa. Now, South Africa has been a regular attendee of this conference. Its president has attended every G7 summit since 2018. So what's the reason behind this snub? Well, there could be a host of factors, but we've zeroed in on three. First, it could be a tit-for-tat move, given South Africa declined to attend Japan's own major summit with African leaders in Tunisia last year. The TICAD Summit, which stands for Tokyo International Conference of African Development, has been held every three years since 1993, so it's a big one to miss. Now, a second factor could be that this snub is a reflection of diverging interests between South Africa and Japan vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine war. South Africa has refused to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is sure to have irked Japan, which has joined Western sanctions against Russia and has laid more and more emphasis on the need for like-minded countries to band together. Also, South Africa has made efforts to maintain good relations with Russia and China since the war broke out. In February this year, the three countries held a 10-day naval exercise, which overlapped with the first anniversary of the war in Ukraine. Now, the third reason behind South Africa's omission from the G7 summit could be that unlike previous G7 hosts such as Canada, France, UK and Germany, who were more interested in Africa per se, Japan is this time more focused on its own Asian region, especially the Indo-Pacific. For our last topic, we're looking at how the violence in Sudan, which has claimed more than 400 lives, has affected its seven neighbours. Egypt, Libya, Chad, South Sudan, Ethiopia and Eritrea. Now, these seven countries have varied stakes in Sudan. Let's start with Egypt. Egypt shares close political ties with one of the two sides which are fighting Sudan's army chief. 
But the other side, led by the deputy of the Sudanese army, or the RSF, is believed to be backed by the UAE, which is a major financial supporter of Egypt. Also, Egypt has taken in millions of Sudanese over the years. More so, Egypt has viewed Sudan, or rather its military chief, as a key ally in its long-running dispute with Ethiopia over the controversial Renaissance Dam. Let's now look at Ethiopia. Ethiopia and Sudan have fraught tensions, mainly because of border skirmishes most recently in Tigray. Now, we just mentioned the Renaissance Dam, which Egypt has opposed. There are fears that if the conflict in Sudan continues, it could threaten Ethiopia's $4 billion Blue Nile Dam, which Sudan says could present a threat to its own Nile dams and its citizens. For Chad and Eritrea, it's more of humanitarian concerns. Chad is already hosting about half a million refugees from Sudan and fears its public institutions could face more pressure if more refugees cross the border. On the flip side, Eritrea worries about its 1.3 lakh refugees and asylum seekers that are currently in Sudan. In recent years, Sudan has emerged as the main route for Eritreans fleeing repressive rule in their own country. Many Eritrean refugees in northern Ethiopia fled from their camps during the Tigray War between 2020 and 2022. Eritrean refugees in Sudan could face a similar plight if any conflict beyond Khartoum escalates. Now, Libya and Sudan are both conflict-hit countries. Sudanese militia fighters played a part in the conflict in Libya in 2011. There have been tensions between the two countries with regard to one providing refuge to the other's rebel groups. Now, if we look at South Sudan, which declared independence from Sudan in 2011, it's more about oil revenue. 95% of South Sudan's public revenue relies on oil revenue and Sudan is crucial to these oil exports as a critical pipeline runs through Sudan to a port on the Red Sea. Therefore, from South Sudan's perspective, it's worried about whether fighting in Sudan could inhibit these oil exports or worse, if it results in damage or attacks to the pipeline. Lastly, let's look at the CAR or the Central African Republic. Like Chad, this is a war-torn country and in the north of the country, rebels are potentially linked to forces in both Chad and Sudan. There are also ethnic and trade linkages between populations in northeast CAR and Sudan, which could be greatly affected by the ongoing conflict in Sudan. There have been some allegations that Sudan's army chief supports rebel forces in CAR and therefore the ongoing situation there could have a spillover effect on the stability in CAR too. Thank you so much for watching. This is Pia Kushankuti for The Print.